Welcome, everybody, to another one of these events here in this great new building. Uh, as a former Melbourne Uni person, I haven't been in here a lot, but I've uh, managed to run a few events here in the last six months alone. My name's Shane Huntington. Um, I am the CEO of a kids' cancer charity, and every now and then I have the pleasure of coming and running events like this, which I think is because I do a radio show on Sundays that uh, one or two people may have heard over the last 30 years. Um, today we're having a, a great debate and it will be between two incredible groups, uh, one biomedical engineers and the other chemical engineers. And I just learnt today that these were two different things. Uh, I didn't know before. <laughs> and are there any biologists here? No biologists. I met a microbiologist outside earlier. He was a lot bigger than I was expecting. <laughs> this is the level of comedy that I'm gonna set as the baseline today that you would be expecting from these two teams. If they do not entertain you, do not vote for them at the end. We wanna be entertained, okay? I very much want to acknowledge that we are on the lands of the Wurundjeri people um, of the Kulin Nation here, and I pay my respects to them past, present, and emerging. Um, I think it's very important that we acknowledge this, especially in these very public settings where a lot of people um, are entering a space that we now get to enjoy. So today we're going to be debating a really simple and I think potent question, especially for those of us who are over the age of 50, that is, should people live to 150 years of age? And I suspect some of these people are going to be trying to do it and some of them are going to be trying to prevent it. Um, I'm not sure who I like best. On the negative team, it's kind of, it sounds bad. We, <laughs> we have, first up, uh, to my left, uh, your right, is Dr. Claire Anderson. Claire is the team captain, and Claire is the group director of, of the sustainability performance for Wally globally, and is, a passionate, is passionate about the decarbonisation of energy, chemical and resources industries. Welcome, Claire. <laughs> Next to Claire... Uh, I'm going to change the order here, that's all good, uh, is Professor Ray D'Agostine. Ray is a professor of chemical engineering and leads a research group studying interfacial phenomena, such as drops, bubbles and particles, or as I like to call him, the ice cream guy. Um, he is also running uh, as CEO and is co-founder of a new com company startup called Tiny Bright Things. Ray is also a very good friend of mine, so welcome, Ray. And at the end is Professor Sandra Kentish, who is a Redmond Barry Distinguished Professor. Sandra has broad interests in industrial separations. Sounds like you're pulling companies apart. Um, <laughs> particularly the use of membrane technology for energy, food and water applications. She's also the project leader within the ARC Dairy Innovation Hub and a researcher within the Future Fuels CRC. Welcome, Sandra. <laughs> and the positive, I mean, the affirmative team um, positive. <laughs> Dr. Matthew Maria, he's the team captain. Matt is a senior lecturer in the Department of Biomedical Engineering and he studies the interactions between nanomaterials and biological systems using a mixture of computational and experimental techniques. Welcome, Matt. <laughs> Michael Holes, uh, next up, is a PhD student in the Department of Biomedical Engineering studying new methods of designing and fabricating cell culture Models for investigating diseases. As a former R&D project manager for a Medtech startup, he was interested in commercialising devices for extracorporeal therapy. Um, <laughs> Michael has been actively involved in bringing new technologies into the clinic, and his bio I made longer than everyone else's because he doesn't yet have his PhD. Welcome. <laughs> and last but not least, Dr Big... Donongbang, did I get that right? Thank you. Is a research fellow in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. He applies software engineering and high performance computing to medical signal and image analysis, focusing on identifying new pathological features. Big welcome. Okay, so the way the debate will work today is we will first hear from our two team captains, one after the other, and then we will go from side to side, and then at the very end, we'll ask for our team captains to wrap up. At the, at the end, I will ask you to give us a bit of a cheer for the two sides, and that is the way in which we'll determine the winner. Does that all sound okay? Everyone, no one's confused? All right. Well then, 
um, each participant will have five minutes to deliver their argument. At the end of five minutes, they will hear this sound. That's the cue for them to stop speaking, like right there. Now, if you've worked with academics like I have for many, many years, you'll know that this is going to be an extremely traumatic experience. So <laughs> is there anyone in the audience willing to provide hugs? Because if an academic gets cut off mid-sentence, they will require a hug at some stage before the end of the day, I'm just saying. It can be very, very difficult. Um, but I, I believe they can all do it. So, without further ado, I would like to invite the team captain for the negative team, Claire, to begin her presentation. Claire, over to you. Great, thanks very much, Shane. Can you hear me okay? Excellent. I want to start by evoking some feelings of anxiety and then leave you with hopefully a feeling of hope. So we're entering a new epoch. Uh, we're currently in an epoch called the Halocene and it's a wonderful epoch. An average temperature of 14 degrees Celsius. It effectively supports life as we know it today. But the new epoch we're entering into is the, is the Anthropocene and this is an epoch that's caused by us, us humans. We've hit 1.2 degrees of warming, you probably know that already. It's the highest temperature that this planet has seen in over 100,000 years. But the worst news is that it's accelerating. So from 1970 to 2010, every decade we saw 0.18 degrees of warming per decade. Over the last decade, it's now risen to 0.26 degrees per decade. If we continue at this rate, we will smash through 2 degrees C in the next two decades. And we will smash through 3 degrees C by the end of this century. This is not good news, as I'm sure you can imagine. So let me start with the concept of climate tipping points. And you're probably familiar with these already. And these are elements in our planetary system that if we pass, there's no going back. There's five climate tipping points that if we hit 1.5 degrees, we're at risk of triggering. And these include the melting of the Antarctic ice sheet, the collapse of the Greenland ice sheet, the abrupt thaw of the boreal permafrost in Canada, the abrupt loss of the Bantant sea ice and the die off of all coral reefs. It's a course we can't correct if we do get to that point. It sets us off on a world where we would see 10 metres of sea level rise within potentially the next few generations. It flips our systems, our systems of oceans and, and forests that are currently carbon absorbing into carbon releasing. And this is quite scary. Our planet is of course precious, it's the only one we have. And I'd like to start by introducing a framework called Planetary Boundaries, which you may have heard of. It was uh, developed by a group of scientists in Stockholm and here in Australia, actually, uh, a couple of decades ago. And what it does is it helps us to understand the Earth's systems in terms of how we preserve the Halocene. And this framework consists of nine boundaries and they are climate change, biodiversity, land system change, freshwater, biogeochemicals, so that's the nitrogen and the phosphorus that we're currently putting into our systems through artificial fertilisers. Ocean acidification is another one, air pollution, ozone depletion and novel entities and that includes pollution such as microplastics. And as, the, as of this date, we're currently breaching three of these planetary boundaries already in terms of being in, in the red zone. If I think about biodiversity loss specifically, we're at a point now where we could be entering the sixth mass extinction of this planet. Current extinction rates are estimated to be between 100 and 1,000 times base levels. So if that's not enough to get you worried, it's also a fact that 90%, 96% of the mammals on this planet are either human or bred for human consumption. So enough of the anxiety, let's talk to hope. Spoiler alert, it really doesn't involve humans living to 150 years old. We do have a window, it's small and it's closing, but it's still there and we need to act now. This decade, the 2020s, has been described as the decade of hope. 
It's the decade in which we can turn the curve around. We can bend our emissions back and start reducing carbon emissions. We can start protecting biodiversity. We can start maintaining the planetary boundaries. I'm optimistic. As humans, we're extraordinary. We've, in, we've achieved incredible things, and I think we're going to hear a lot of the great things today from our fellows here from um, biomedical engineering, that we can do amazing things. We can put a person on the, on the Earth, on the Earth, we are on the Earth actually, we can put a person on the Moon, we can create a vaccine in one year, a process that normally takes 10. So I think the structure is here for us to turn this around. 88% of current emissions are currently covered by net zero commitments of countries. I think that's for me to finish, but I'll just say that I would much rather live to 85.3 years, which is the current life expectancy of a, a female Australian, than live to 150, knowing that my children and my grandchildren are living in a more sustainable world. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Is everyone feeling pretty negative after that? <laughs> All right, uh, over to you, Matt, for the affirmative, and you have five minutes and 20 seconds. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, is this one? Yes. Um, I completely agree with what Claire has said, except for the end. We absolutely need to deal with climate change. That is not in debate. Not, none, of us, none of us dispute that in any way. The debate is whether or not we should live to 150 years. And I think that uh, before we get to whether or not we should live to 150 years, I want us to imagine what that really means. And when we talk about 150 years, when you talk about living to 150, I mean living to 150, not just existing. Um, I want you to think, all, all, all of you to imagine what all that extra healthy life, what the, what the WHO calls healthy life expectancy, what that would be like. The, the extra experiences, the extra life you could live, the time with loved ones, the, the, the wisdom you could impart, uh, the good you could do for the world. Um, there's, now, that to me is justification enough for why we should live to 150. Now, of course, we should do it sustainably. There's no doubt. There's no doubt at all that we should do it sustainably. Now, the truth is, is that we're on, we're, we, are, we are slowly creeping towards that target. Um, we have made steady in increases in, in life expectancy every year. Life expectancy at every age has increased every year um, with some, uh, when there's not uh, major pandemics uh, in the last couple of years. Um, in, in Australia, in the last uh, 20 years, we've expanded, life, we've expanded healthy life expectancy at 65, two years, one to two years, depending on if you're male or female. Um, so we're on track, uh, but the truth is, the only way that we're going to actually get to 150 years is by treating aging. If we cured all cardiovascular disease, that would buy us about uh, five and a half years. Uh, if we cured all cancer, it would buy us about three and a half years. So the only way we get to 150 years is curing aging. But this is actually good news because curing aging, aging is the main reason that we have non-healthy life years. And by curing aging, we have healthy life years, and that is what we want. And the benefits go way beyond personal uh, and, and, uh, and emotional to what the benefits would be for society. Because the truth is, we don't do our best work unless you're an athlete or an actor when we're young. Um, when you look at uh, scientific accomplishment, it's uniformly distributed across a scientist's entire career. Um, so we have an equal chance of doing our greatest work at any point. Uh, when we look at uh, entrepreneurs, they're actually more successful into, uh, up until 60, and the study only went to 65, with a minor decrease uh, into 65. So we're, more success we're just as successful as we get older. And the other thing that's wonderful is that we become more altruistic as we get older, and that is exactly what the world needs. We need more altruistic thinking, more compassion, more care for each other and for the world. And the best way to get that is with an older population. At least that's what the research says. And I would also say, let's think we need longer term thinking as well. And what better way than to have longer lifespans to even people who are selfish, who only care about themselves. 150 years looks a lot more important if you only care about yourselves, right? You, 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 all of a sudden we're caring about what all of us are caring about into the future. And you, if you're caring about your children, that's 300 years, right? An incredible, or you know, 200, 250. Depending on when you have children, maybe it would change. Um, so we need longer term thinking 100%. And let's think a little bit longer term than just climate change to all of the threats to all of human life because the natural state of the universe is empty, lifeless rock. We're an anomaly and humans are the best bet to save all life 
from existential threats, even the ones that we cause, right? So not just climate change, but an asteroid coming from the Earth. The only things that are going to deal with an asteroid coming from the Earth are humans. The dolphins won't do it, the whales won't do it, the beautiful rainforest life is not going to deal with it. The only option we have is long-term, compassionate humanity. And so everything we can do to make humans live longer and be more compassionate, we should and we must do. Thank you. Well, you had, you had like an extra minute and 10 seconds there. I, I but talk faster. I think it didn't matter. You know, I, I think everyone who's young, everyone who's a bit older, we all felt included in some way. I mean, the only people you insulted were things you insulted were the whales. It's not bad. It's not bad. Uh, thank you, man. Um, only in their ability to deal with asteroids. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, so our captains have now spoken, and I'm always a little bit easier on the remaining participants. So for the rest of the group, they will get a little... 30 second warning before the end of their five minutes so that they at least know to wrap up their, their statements. Um, of course, when we come back to the final bit with the, uh, with the captains, they will again lose that warning. So next up, uh, Ray, good luck. All right, uh, thank you so much for the chance to speak and to follow that act. Uh, one thing you may not know about Matt and I is we went to the same high school in the US just about 20 years apart. Um, anyway, look, uh, I am so glad that Matt brought up healthy life because I want us to think about what it means to live to 150. Uh, we're really talking about doubling the average lifespan, which is about 77 years on average. Uh, and, and let's think about what that means if we have that many more people, because the predictions are for population by the end of the century to have 10.4 billion people. But if we're living twice as long, all of those estimates get much larger. So let's think about what that kind of impact has on just some general things that happen from our lives. Think about waste generation. We dump about 2.2 billion tons of waste per annum. If we put that in trucks, it would go around the world 24 times. If we double our population, we're talking about 4 billion tons annually, and we will run out of landfill space. And you might think recycling. Yes, we recycle about 20% of our waste. Um, and, and there's other ways to think about how waste would fit in, in, in our lives. And, and one of the ones is, of course, you're all thinking of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch which is an area about 1.6 million square kilometers. That's about twice the size of New South Wales, four times the size of Victoria. Uh, and it has 1.8 trillion pieces of plastic. That's about 250 pieces of debris for every person. It also weighs about 100,000 tons, or equivalent to 740 Boeing 777s. Of course, Boeing planes are supposed to be in the sky. Too soon? Um, uh, now, uh, it has grown tenfold in every decade since 1945. But when you think about that, it's not just a plastic island, it's also a soup. And that's because of microplastics. And we're going to get to healthy life by thinking about microplastics. Now, there are a, we produce about 400 million tons of plastic every year. And you might think recycling, but to date on all of the plastic we have ever made as humanity, we've recycled 8% of it. Now... Part of that is microplastics that are, of course, formed when we put these things in landfills. They become small particles, and they end up in all our waterways, not just the ocean. We have about 20 million metric tons of plastic that were going into our ecosystems in 2016, and it's gone up. Estimates are 53 million tons by the end of the decade. Let's think about implications of having microplastics around because animals eat them. We get 20% of our food our protein on the planet comes from fish. So about 1.4 billion people, protein comes from fish. Um, here are some other recent studies. On average, people ingest about five grams of plastic every week. That's the weight of a credit card. Uh, you could think of it as 50,000 particles a year, and they end up everywhere. Hopefully you saw on the age that fantastic picture of microplastics in the brain, but it's not limited to that. It's blood, wrong, lungs, reproductive systems, uh, transferred to, to fetuses, like microplastics are quite pervasive. Um, research has suggested you can get lung inflammation, high risk of lung cancer, metabolic disorders, neurotoxicity, endocrine disruption, weight gain, that's not my problem, it's late night eating, insulin and decreased reproductive health. So there's lots of prizes that come along with microplastics. Now, how on earth does this get to healthy life? Well, it brings us to pharmaceuticals. Because that healthy life and that target of aging, and I love that, let's stop aging, that solution is going to be pharmacological in nature if we want to live to 150 years. So let's think about 
the pharmaceutical industry. If you think fast food is the archetype for single-use plastics, the pharmaceutical industry runs circles around it. That's not just in use of saying those blister packs with your, for your tablets, but actually in the production of drugs. The pharmaceutical industry doesn't even clean reactors anymore. They use plastic bags and throw them away. And we are very happy about sustainability. But when we talk about healthcare, we kind of get this blind eye to it and go, oh, maybe that's okay. So the pharma industry on average makes 300 million tons of waste that's commingled with plastic every year and half of that is single use. And you think that's bad, but let's get to healthcare. Because that's the other part about stopping aging, to have that healthy life. And we're talking about 70% of sanitary trash and 35% of general waste in European hospitals are plastic. When we hit COVID, that went up, oh, thank you for the warning, by 300%. So if we think about living to 150 years, to have that healthy life, think about what that'll look like. You'll look at mountains of waste, we'll have run out of landfills. You'll think about your vacation to a large plastic island, and don't worry, there's one growing in the Atlantic as well. And our medical resources, mitigating to having healthy, stopping aging to be healthy, will actually be sourced and focused on mitigating the impacts from all the microplastics in our lives and in us. And I'll leave you with this. It doesn't matter because we're full of plastic. Life will not be effing fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, Ray. Uh, I, know, I know they're the negative side, but the fact that he didn't mention hair loss and microplastics gives me hope <laughs> that there is another reason that can be repaired. So uh, now, it's, it's important after some, a strong start like that to bring in the big guns. And of course, I always like to bring in a PhD student at this point because we all know that their level of enthusiasm, joy and love has as yet not been squeezed out of them by the system. You can even tell by their height. <laughs> Michael, over to you. Sorry to... I think yeah. You might want to find a new PhD student. I don't know. That's... <laughs> No, it is, uh, yeah, it's very good to be here. It's lovely to see so many familiar faces in the crowd. Hopefully that comes in handy later on for the judging. But uh, I want to start off by maybe offering a bit of an olive branch to the chemical engineers in the room and say where we certainly agree to follow up on Matt's point is that regardless of whether we extend human lifespan or not, we as a global community need to come to terms with the effect that the human population is having on the planet. We need to be better stewards of the environment. That's certainly something where we agree completely. And I think that it's, hopefully we can show that a longer lifespan can actually lead to some of those changes that we might need to consider when structuring our society that, that can help create better stewardship for the planet. Because it's not necessarily accurate to assume that the overall population is going to double just because people are living twice as long. You know, people aren't going to remain sexually active over that entire lifespan. People aren't going to continue to produce children at the same rate that we currently are. Shift, there are already global trends in place where attitudes around reproduction are shifting. And that is going to continue regardless of the effects of human lifespan. That is simply a matter, of course, when trying to address these issues of climate change. And I also want to bring up that the, you know, we need to maybe reckon with some of the narratives and societal norms that we exhibit in our society and how that contributes to waste management practices. You know, this attitude of live fast and die young maybe isn't the best to keep in mind when we're trying to deal with problems that really are, you know, the next generations are going to face or the generations after that. We need to take a longer term perspective on how to address some of these issues. And before I, before I rebut some of the arguments around the waste management points, I do want to just take a second to you know, also plug some of the wonderful research that's being done in the biomedical engineering department and the work that's currently underway to help support the kind of te devices and technologies that we need to support that longer life. Because while it is true that we need to address the issues of human aging and how to, you know, and how to factor in treatment and clinical therapies to address those changes over time. It's also true that at this moment, really extending human lifespan relies on delaying disease, preventing and delaying the onset of disease. And there's wonderful work going on, you know, looking at modeling of arthritis in the group or in the department and also different tissue engineering strategies for helping to address chronic diseases. These are technologies that can help us now that are also in pursuit of this longer life expand, lifespan extending work. And that is valuable 
whether or not we actually achieve this goal of 150 degrees, uh, 150 years. We're, we might achieve the 150 degrees goal from the sound of it. It's, it, it's not a pretty picture. <laughs> but when it comes to the waste management, I think we want to be mindful about, especially when it comes to the pharmaceutical companies. Last I checked, there are plenty of chemical engineers invo involved in pharmaceuticals as well, right? I don't, it's, not, it's not the doctors that are designing the plastics that we wrap all of these pharmaceuticals in, right? And additionally, the, you know, if we think about the other companies that are the sectors of the economy that fall under chemical engineering, perhaps you know, my, things like petrochemical or energy companies come to mind like Dow Chemical, Shell, Chevron, BP. I'm simply struck by the irony of receiving criticism on waste management from an industry where millions of barrels of oil are spelt with such regularity that it almost seems like part of the plan. <laughs> And I think that additionally, let's not pretend that the waste that we're making is anything other than what the materials that we have to work with inside of this, inside of this system. We have certain regulations that we have to fulfill in order to maintain the safety and efficacy of the treatments that we're designing. And that means that we have to take, you know, we have to take measures on the materials we use in, sort of, in terms of durability. And, and there I really hope that there are, you know, there are more innovations coming from materials handling and materials production because I've been hearing about plastic that's made from corn for about 25 years and it seems like, you know, we still have this giant garbage patch. I don't know what's happening. It's <laughs> but I think that the, you know, the horrific problem of biomedical waste would improve as quickly as, you know, there is more of that work in sustainable technologies that can produce more of the sustainable materials. That shouldn't preclude doing the work of the biomedical research and of furthering these, these aims of reaching 150. And so to sum up, that's good. Wow, that actually worked out. All right. uh, yeah, we need to be prudent about the cost benefit of how you know, our activities are placing on the environment. And, but we stand, to so, we stand to gain so much as a society now by pursuing this goal of extending the human lifespan because as, and as we move closer to 150 becoming a reality, we'll have a better understanding of what hurdles might still lie ahead and whether it is still worth it then. Well done, Michael. Your team has ga uh, gained four seconds that you can use at your discretion. Um, so I told you, the PhDs are always a bit feisty. It was kind of like saying, you know, chemical engineering versus biomedical engineering. We're going to build a wall in chemical engineering and gonna pay for it on the campus. <laughs> you know, um, harsh, man. I love it. I love it. Call them out. <laughs> for the negative team, our final speaker, Sandra, over to you. Thank you, Shane. Let me start by trying to rebut some of the arguments we've just heard from our uh, affirmative team over here. First of all, Matt made us try to think we could live the good life, that we were slowly increasing our uh, age of that we die at or whatever. But my understanding is that's not true. The, the peak age in the US has plateaued and is starting to fall again. The people are projected to live shorter in life and this is because of increasing obesity, because of issues again with living the good life. Uh, we can that people, the rate of uh, the age of which uh, populations such as uh, affluent ones are, is in fact uh, has in fact peaked. He also argued that scientific accomplishment went over our lifespans. Again, I dispute that. Einstein made all his important discoveries before the age of 30. The theory of relativity he made before the age of 30, he spent the rest of his life trying to do something useful uh, and didn't manage to do anything. <laughs> Now, as an aside, I'm told this is actually because he left his first wife at the age of 30 and she was really the power behind the throne. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and similarly, both of the speakers have tried to argue we need longer-term thinking, but surely we all know the only answer to long-term thinking would be to expand the, 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 the lifetime of our parliaments beyond the current three or four years, because until we do that, there is no such thing as longer-term thinking. But let me, in my remaining minutes, get to my actual arguments. I, as despite what we're hearing, the biomedical engineers are focused on quantity rather than quality of life. Only chemical engineers can give you quality of life. <laughs> now, the biomedical engineers talked about the old industries, the ones we don't like to do anymore, the fossil fuels. That's not us anymore. You read, you know, you're, 
you're in the past. We will now give you clean water, good food. We will even give you good red wine. Uh, we will give you enough lithium to charge your phones with to keep your Apple iPhones going for the rest of your lives. Uh, as chemical engineers, importantly, we can reduce the impact of climate change. We can stop you getting just way too hot. Uh, and, of course, this is the elephant in the room. We've already heard Claire talk about this. But climate change is going to lead to severe water source shortages, loss of crops, and, in turn, we already know this is leading to environmental refugees. Uh, the United Nations Commission for Refugees uh, says that the number of people displaced uh, by climate change-related disasters since 2010 has risen to 21.5 million and by 2050, this could drive more than 200 million people to move. Those people aren't worried about living to 150. They're worried about living until next week. Uh, similarly, a Stanford report published in Nature estimates that climate has influenced between 3 and 20% of armed conflict over the last century and that the influence will likely increase dramatically. Look at Ukraine, look at Gaza. It's hard to live to 150 if you get shot. Um, but ultimately, the other issue we're facing is the cost of this medical intervention. Again, to give you some facts, I still have some time. Uh, a prosthetic leg will cost you anywhere between $10,000 and $70,000. The Argus II bionic eye is cost, estimated to cost about US $150,000, excluding the cost of implantation surgery, while Parkinson's medication currently costs $700 a month with deep brain stimulation, about $25,000. Um, a time. Now we already know the Australian economy is in deep, deep trouble. Those of you who saw the national accounts a f half an hour ago would know uh, that we are at the slowest rate of annual growth in our economy since 1991. We can't afford any of the things these guys are talking about. There is no money. Do we want to prioritise medical care over housing, over education? If we were to fund Medicare properly, universities wouldn't exist. We wouldn't have, none of us would have a job except the biomedical engineers, <laughs> simply because of the lack of money. The only people indeed who'd be able to afford to live to the age of 150 will be the uber rich. Do we want to prioritise Rupert Murdoch living to 150 so he can marry his sixth wife? <laughs> or do we all want to live a, a good and happy life until the age of 35. I'd rather have a good time than a long time on this planet. Oh, bring in the, bring in the real heat there, Sandra. I've got to say, as a physicist, this is like Christmas watching this play out. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. Well, you know, the whales aren't going to... We're the ones who are going to stop the asteroid, I'm just saying. <laughs> Big... Uh, Bring the team home, buddy. <laughs> Thank you very much. So um, there's a lot of talking points um, that has been suggested. The first thing that I would like to bring up is if Sandra were suggest, uh, was suggesting that the US government does not have the social safety net to support our collective survival, we agree. Um, on the other hand, when the Kemmens were talking about um, bringing us more lithium, getting us better wine. Aren't we basically trying to support the status quo? Um, I would like you to draw your attention to the fact that we are at the moment over consuming because of our mental attitude of live fast and die young. We have kids early because before I'm beyond 40, then maybe women wouldn't be able to have to bear kids anymore, right? Because when we're over some certain age, we cannot walk anymore. And because when we are over some certain age, then we can't do certain tasks that we would like to do. So that is the core that I would like to bring to you, the problem of our society today and why we should support living to 150 years. So in this debate, there were actually two main clash points. The first one is the fact that what do we want to prioritize? Do we want to prioritize our current way of living or do we want to prioritize changing the way we're living by living longer in a more quality um, way? And the second point is, do we want, does the planet, not only do we want to, but does the planet and can the planet support 
our life and our activities? The clear answer from their side is, of course not. If we were to live to 150 years, living the same way that we did, of course the planet would not be able to support us, regardless of how many lithium batteries do we get and regardless of how good our wines are going to get. So I would like to imagine this. Imagine a world where you are unbounded by your retirement age of 67. You are not bounded by the median mean lifespan of 83 in Australia. Um, we can, no, we can long have longer term visions, elect politicians that, po that promises us more things in the longer term than just a three to four year cycle. And we can stop having this um, conversation about I'll be dead by the time the planet burns anyway. Because by then, if everybody who support their life to 150 in a quality manner, we can be a better steward of the planet because the problem for the young is now the problem for everybody, right? Young and old, we care about this place. We care about our livelihood as much as the planet. Many of us do not actually care that much about the planet because like Sandra has suggested, we can't leave until next week. And by making us think long term that we have to survive way beyond next week with the proper health care and the proper support from the medical industry, biomed engineers, um, we can actually think beyond that. So there has been some interesting research, um, as we all know, that when we live longer, and I think this is also common sense, we tend to have less children. Uh, with the imp and that is linked to the inequality of life that we actually have. We don't actually need to have 10 kids just because eight of them would probably die. Um, we have less kids because we know that we can support, we can cherish the time we have together given the means that we have. So actually, believe it or not, a study from 2017 has actually suggested that having one less kid actually remove 58 tons of carbon emissions throughout their lifetime. So compared to 2.4 metric tons, living the rest of our lives without a car. Just put that, to put that into perspective. We live more in, with more quality, we use less things. And believe it or not, um, there has been a simulated study which correlates very well with OECD data that the longer we live, the lower the household consumption will be because we actually plan longer term about what we spend and how do we spend them. So yes, uh, you don't actually have to experience everything everywhere all at once if we live in up to 150 years. There is no pressure for us to finish our career by 60, win the Nobel Prize by 45. You know, sometimes there's been even the saying that some of the greatest minds of our time didn't get the Nobel Prize just because they weren't lucky enough to live long enough to be nominated for one, right? And I think for that, many of us in this room would agree that we would like to at least be judged on the merit of our work not rather by the merit of whether we live long enough to be lucky enough to be nominated for one. And with that, I would like to leave you with this hopeful thoughts. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Big. Is anyone else in the audience starting to think about their superannuation portfolio? <laughs> Just, I'm not sure it's gonna get me to 150. <laughs> That's my biggest concern, not the planet. Um, okay, to sum up now, we're inviting our two captains back. Uh, they're each given five minutes to bring their collective arguments from their side home. And we're going to start off with Claire for the negative. Thanks very much, Shane. All right, I think what we've heard is quality versus quantity. I think also what we've heard is we desperately need chemical engineers. We need chemical engineers to solve these wicked problems that we have and we need to do it in the lifetimes that we have, not an extended lifetime in my opinion. I don't think I'm going to win a Nobel Prize whether I live to 85 or whether I live to 150. But I think we've got this if we throw all our energy behind it we put money behind it, we put brains behind it, 
we can solve the 17 sustainable development goals, as Sandra mentioned, about people living below the poverty line, people in war zones. How do we get quality of life for those people at the moment? I dare say we do need the dolphins, but it's not to stop the meteorites. I think we need dolphins because we need biodiversity. We need those ecosystems in place. We need to keep our planetary boundaries intact. And I'll finish by saying I've thought about this from the year 2100. The year 2100, I'll be 125 years old. I might, hopefully I'll have grandchildren. I might even have some great grandchildren. And I'm sure they'll be there still mocking me at 125 years old of all the things that I can't do, the technology that I can't use properly. I think that I don't want to be in that situation when I'm 125 years old. I might be able to go on a, on a holiday to a plastic island in an ocean that's 10 metres taller than it was, you know, 50 years ago. I'm not sure that I want that. I think I, what I really want is a quality of life for the 8 billion people that live on this planet today. And I think we can do that with the help of the chemical engineers and even the biomedical engineers. I think there's a role for them as well. We can work something out for them. So with that, I say, let's be grateful what, for what we've had and what we do have and live to a ripe old 87.3 years. Thanks very much. That was a very positive end to the negative team's argument. <laughs> thank you, Claire, and thank you to the entire team. Okay, uh, taxi. Uh, Matt, over to you to conclude on behalf of you and your colleagues. Uh, my pleasure. Um, I, I, I do want to... I'll start and go backwards, I think. So, uh, Claire said that she wants quality of life for everyone, and so do I, of course. It seems very strange to just draw the line arbitrarily at the biomedical, uh, the, the biomedical uh, applications we have now. So at 47, when, when the life expectancy was 47 before we invented penicillin, were we happy then? Why would we just arbitrarily draw a line with what we have now and say, nope, that's enough life for everyone? There is no natural lifespan for humans. It is natural for every complex organism that we know of to strive to live longer. That is the natural thing. So. Um, Claire also said that she wants to keep our, well, we'll get to that one at the end. Maybe I'll go, maybe I'll go back to the, to the other one. So, uh, Ray gave us a lot of information about plastics, right? Which is wonderful, but not related, relevant to the debate, really. Um, but I, 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 but, <laughs> but one, of the only, one of the only things he said relevant to the debate was that by having, uh, more, by living longer, we'll have more children. That simply isn't true. Japan, which has the, the oldest population in the world, in any, any country in the world, has been below uh, replacement for decades. So we know that when we get older, we have less children. That's what the trends suggest. Now, who knows what would happen at 150, but that's certainly what, what the evidence suggests. Uh, Sandra also said, let's see. Um, oh, and a lot of issues about plastic use. Yes, let's use glass instead. That's wonderful. It's more expensive. Somehow the chemical engineers have made plastic so much cheaper, and that's why pharmaceutical companies use it. Um, okay, so uh, Sandra said that, uh, that, that U.S. life rates are decreasing. Uh, that's true because of the pandemic. Uh, and she suggested that it was because of obesity. Now we have drugs that treat obesity for the first time ever in human history. Uh, they're, they're not official yet, but we've all heard about them. Um, so obesity is falling faster than it ever has. Well, in, the mo in, in, in modern times. Um, she said that, uh, that Einstein did his best work uh, when he was young. Yes, that's an anecdote. What I cited was a study. More than 3,000 scientists said, more than 2,000 scientists studied, actually. So this was, this was for everyone, not just for Einstein. He's one person. Um, and most of us aren't going to be Einstein. Um, OK. Uh, she also said uh, that she'd rather have a good time than a long time. That is exactly the problem with chemical engineering. Uh, and she, she cited, she cited lithium, lithium ion batteries. Yes, once again, we've, we've rushed towards a technology that we don't know how to recycle properly. 10% of lithium ion batteries are recycled in Australia each year, 10%. Just another example of waste coming and not, not being thought through carefully the way we think through the changes that biomedical engineering makes, which we're doing right now in this very debate. Um, yes, she also angry about in, uh, early stages of innovation being available to the rich. Thus it has ever been. Yes, the rich get things first. Would we all like to get the, the newest things first? Yes, but also let them test it. It's fine, okay? <laughs> Once, it's, once the edges are sanded off, you know, then, then, then we can get 
the better, uh, the better bionic limbs. It's fine. I, 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 th th that's just the way that our current system works. Could it be better? Yes, absolutely. Should we then, should we just abandon uh, improvement and human, human, uh, human striving because the rich get things first? Absolutely not. Um, yes, uh, no one's making an argument about how to prioritize money either. That's uh, a completely separate thing. The question is, should we live to 150? And the answer is yes. Um, yes, okay, so. Finally, I'll just say this, because, because I have been advocating for a much longer term, uh, term vision, I will, I, will, I will imagine myself in, in 80 years thinking about what, uh, what, what, uh, something that Claire said. And she said she wants to keep our planetary boundaries intact. And she also said that she wants to preserve biodiversity. This is the only planet that has bi biodiversity. And the best chance of having more biodiversity is by, by, is by breaking the planetary boundaries and allowing life to spread to other planets. Right? And, and once again, like defending the Earth from external threats or internal threats, right? perhaps a virus will evolve that's so infectious it just destroys everything. The only chance, the only thing that's going to, to, to stop that is humans. And, the, and also the best, chance, the, the best chance for life to spread beyond this planet, also humans. So, even, so no matter how much you like forests and whales, and we all love forests and whales, the best chance to get forests and whales throughout the universe, throughout the galaxy, is humans. And I will leave you with that very long-term thought, and I look forward to having this debate again in 80 years. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. I think no matter what happens here, we can all agree that the, the real winner is love and respect between chemical and biomolecular. <laughs> and as a physicist, it gives me great joy to see that and see it play out given I just learned that there were different fields half an hour ago. So, yeah. All right. It is time to choose a, a winner. I know it's difficult. You either want to die or you want to live. Um, that's kind of where it's going to go. And you just have to choose which way you want to die, either natural death, death at 150 or do the, I think you guys would probably argue, some sort of biotoxin that these guys created in a lab that's going to eat you alive. Uh, tough choices, folks. Um, if you, we're going to do this by a round of applause. So if you believe that the affirmative team have absolutely nailed their arguments for us living to 150, give them a big round of applause. Okay. If on the other hand you believe the incredibly positive arguments of the negative team have won the day, give them an even louder round of applause. Ooh. It's tough, folks, but I think you're all going to have to have a very deep look at your uh, superannuation balances because on this occasion, I'm going to hand the win to the affirmative team and say, chemical engineers, can you please make it happen? <laughs> so, well done, guys. <laughs> all right. So, just to conclude, thank you all very much for coming. It has been great to have such an interactive audience here today. A huge thank you to our two teams. They clearly put a lot of work into their arguments over the, the last week since we first kind of spoke about the details of today. I think we'd all love to live to 150, but we know there are some serious consequences. But it's good to see some great minds thinking about what some of those consequences and realities are. Thanks so much for coming today, and have an excellent rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.